Artists don't always have a ton in common with one another. You know, apart from our idiosyncrasies, the need to make things, the erratic sleep schedules, the obsession with random subjects that no one else knows or understands, and the love of ramen noodles. But almost across the board, we are dreamers. We desire things that we do not currently possess, and we dream big. We use our imagination like a superpower, giving life to ethereal concepts, drawing, painting, and building entire realities that we can enjoy, and if we are lucky, that we can show to the world someday. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Zach, and today we talk about an integral component of being an artist, the importance of dreams. If topics like this, art block, motivation, and others seem to be your cup of tea, please consider subscribing. Well, what do I mean by dream? An artistic dream, at least from my perspective, is the thing you want to bring to life, or the life that you want to lead. For many, the dream is a physical thing, the execution of a magnum opus, a book, an illustration, or perhaps a mural on the side of an important building in your hometown. For others, the dream is more of the ability to paint at a certain level, the artist's life of spending each day creating, or even solitude. The dream is an ambition, a desired outcome, whether finite or ethereal. And we are not limited to a single dream. Indeed, many of us have quite a few, and for artists, we seem to usually have one in each of these categories as a benchmark. Why are dreams so important? Obviously, they're something that we have, something that we as humans tend to conglomerate and hold on to, but why are they important for artists? Well, off the bat, they attach us to our childhood, or at least they attach us to a childish aspect of existence. Many adults start to lose parts of their imagination as they age, but artists can often tether themselves quite strongly to those things. Artists are often called childish, or they have childlike tendencies. I think this is a little condescending, but mostly because we seem as a culture to lack the proper vocabulary to refer to what we are actually saying here. I believe this is referring to the open-mindedness of a child, the ability to conjure an idea and not immediately throw it away. Children are not necessarily more creative than adults, but they are certainly less likely to hurl harsh judgment at their ideas as readily as we do. And this is partly what is meant by creativity. This is what we mean when we talk about it, in some capacity. Because a child can come up with ideas one after the other, they don't really have to wait for a good idea. They don't have the pressure of creating a good idea with their first concept. They're just going to go. They're going to keep searching, and they're going to keep uncovering things, and the odds are in their favor. At some point, they will uncover something magnificent, something beautiful. Dreams attach us to this childlike component. They allow us to yearn for things that we do not have. There's almost a sense that as an adult, you have to come to terms with your fate, your existence, and the reality that has befallen you, whether it is a tragic thing or a beneficial one. But creativity, dreams, are not tied to reality. They're not tied to what reality is right now, at least. They look into the future. Sometimes they also look at the past and try to bring it forward, but most of the time, they're future-focused. And so holding on to this childlike capacity to dream is a wonderful thing. And of course this is beneficial for artists, because it leads us to a place where we're able to process that which does not yet exist. Dreams also provide us with direction. I've talked about this a bit, but we need mile markers, we need benchmarks, and we need guideposts. A dream can give you a clear and definable direction. Even though it often starts quite abstract, it gives you the full sum of whatever it is that you need. Let's think about an example for a moment. Let's say you want to make a graphic novel or a comic book. You will immediately try to find exemplars, pieces that are your benchmarks. These are the goal. These are what I would like to make someday. Often this will happen without us even thinking about it. We will simply find a thing, be inspired by it, and yearn to create something of similar quality or skill. This happens to almost all of us. In fact, it's usually what pulled us into art in the first place. And now that you have those examples, you can start pulling apart everything that goes into them and you can break down those individual components. How long are they? How many illustrations do you need to make one function? How many lines of text are there per page, per book? What kind of story do you want to tell? And if you go down this rabbit hole just with comic books alone, 
you probably have an idea of how many things you can run into, how many answers to these questions you might uncover. If you come to find that your illustration skills aren't up to the task, that is a single thing to work on, though it will likely subdivide into composition, anatomy, coloring, lighting, and so on. But either way, it reduces the amount of things that you have to process and think about to a manageable load. Even though this single example has a tremendous amount of pieces, it is still far less amorphous than get better at drawing. Something that loose is often overwhelming unless you really enjoy the process or are young enough that you have your whole life and time ahead of you. The direction provided by a dream can be a constant spark, relighting your ignition and pulling you forward. In my re-engagement with my own artistic journey, this has been a massive component because I've been able to look at what I really want to do, the stories that I want to tell, and then immediately start looking at examples of those things and going, well, if I want to write a children's book, it's pretty easy to go find a children's book that has the writing style and the illustration style that I like. I can study those things and then I end up with what you're watching play out here in the background. That comes from understanding my dream and benefiting from the direction that I get from that dream, from the understanding of its individual baseline components. In the same way, I had these aspirations to tell stories to write books, but I never have until I stumbled upon someone else doing the same thing. It was actually in part Trent Kaniga and one of his recent novels he came out with as an audiobook. I went and downloaded it, and I listened to it while I was on several sets of plane flights. It was pretty small, maybe seven or eight hours of listening time, but in so doing, I found myself re-engaging with the act of creating stories and writing, and I watched someone else do it. Now, obviously, he has a background in storytelling and in visual arts. This is what he's done for a long time. He worked for Blizzard. He now owns his own game design company and concept art studio. But telling a story, writing a book, was not in that same wheelhouse. Yes, he had connections, perhaps, but it gave me the inspiration to sit there and try to do it myself. And that's a wonderful thing. That dream gave me some direction and pushed me forward. Nothing new happens without a dream. You may have heard the phrase, necessity is the mother of invention. Unless we want to take that in the abstract that artists need to create, and therefore it is a necessity to them, the notion is simply false. Sure, necessity is a common cause for innovation, but there is a whole brand of human who simply does so for the sake of creating. Us. Artists. New things come to be from the imaginations of creative people and most of the things we produce add beauty and meaning to life. A new form of engine for our car that doesn't use nearly as much fuel would be really great, but that is fundamentally different than a touching story, than a beautiful painting, than a movie. They are simply in different categories. So new things always come on the heels of a dream, unless you stumble upon them through some malevolent black magic in a back alley. But if we're going to be serious here, you have to have a dream if you want to land somewhere. If you continue to work on your art skills with the desire of improving, of getting better, but you haven't honed that in on exactly what that means to you, your improvement, though it will likely occur, will be much slower and much less directed. If you want to achieve something, if you want to bring something to life, if you want to just simply get better, Having a dream, understanding that dream and working toward it will help you get there. You need it. In reality, I think we all have this. When you go and apply for a job, don't you have a dream of having a better job, a dream of being able to provide more for yourself or your family, a dream of making more money? Now, maybe that's taking it a little bit abstractly, but the English language is a funny thing. It's a weird thing, and there is just necessary or unnecessary overlap in so many categories. So we always have a dream when we push for something new, when we try to do something new. So just understand that when it comes to your art, it is no different. If you want to write a book, then that is your dream. You don't have to share it with people. There might be some arrogance in asserting that you have a dream, and your dream might make you vulnerable. If you tell everyone in your life, especially your family and those that are closest to you about your dreams, sometimes you can get some condescension, especially from parents if you're younger. You can get some, oh no, this kid wants to be an artist and I wanted them to be a lawyer or a doctor and they're never gonna be able to feed themselves because every artist starves, which of course is totally false, but 
that can apply some extra pressure. And so there can sometimes be a push to not dream. And really what that comes down to, because that is a, a false dichotomy, it comes down to having rational dreams and rational is decided by the authority figures in your life. You are always going to have a dream if you want something different than what you have now. Dreaming just means looking forward and trying to engage with whatever it is that comes next. So just understand that as a human that desires different things in the future, you have dreams. And now that you know that, you can gain control of them and you can sculpt them in a direction that is helpful and beneficial for you. Dreams are productive. They give us goals, like I've mentioned before. They give us specific things to work toward, things to work for. They give us the benchmarks. We can know when we've gotten to a certain stage. If your goal is to work on that comic, like we mentioned earlier, and your anatomy skills are subpar, you start working on people, and over time, oh my goodness, I can draw the human form from memory without too much effort, and it looks reasonably realistic. Now I can draw the human portrait and oh, that's terrible, but six months later, look at this. I can show 10 different kinds of emotion. I can rotate this figure in my mind, this face, this portrait. I can do it from many different angles. You can see what has been accomplished because you've been working toward that dream. You can see the goals and your reaching of the goals. Dreams give us motivation when times are tough and rest assured, times will be tough. They won't likely be tough all of the time, but the journey is a long one, it is difficult, and a dream can help pull you through that because it's some idea, some hope for the future. I think that perhaps hope and dreams are inextricably linked because if you're going to hold on to a dream and you're going to work toward it, you have to have some hope that it's achievable, right? Otherwise, what are you doing? And so if you truly believe that you can't be a good artist, that you can't achieve the things that you want to, then those dreams are kind of like islands just floating out in the middle of nowhere. They have no nutrients, they have no plants, they have no animals on them. They are just dead in the water, literally. You have to have some measure of hope. And so if you have dreams, you have already conjured some small kindled flame of hope and you can start moving toward it and it can give you that motivation when times are tough. Ambitions are a beautiful thing and they come through when you track a dream. There's an ambition to be better. There's an ambition to achieve. And that can push you when other things struggle to do so. And it can give you resilience when the tough times finally set in. Because the tough times are going to require resilience. They're going to require you to be tough, to be stubborn, to buckle down and to stick to the thing. The points in my life where I've engaged with art very heartily and I burnt myself out, I then look back on and go, what was the point? You gained all these skills and because you didn't have anywhere to put them, you lost them. I can look back on sketchbooks and drawings from years past and go, I was better at drawing people then. I was better at drawing figures then. I was better at drawing whatever. And it's true and it's unfortunate. But in most of those times, I burnt myself out. I over-engaged. I put 20 hours a week into my art and then when I got back to work after the summer, I just didn't have the energy to re-engage. And so the skills and the qualities that I obtained in that surge of activity were lost to me. And my dreams at that point were unknown, or at least I was untethered to them. And so they no longer gave me the resilience to make it through the tough times. So dreams are productive. They help us continue to work. And in a way, they are more efficient. Dreams can provide community. People like to rally around a concept or a dream. Especially for those who do not have strong or defined dreams themselves, seeing one begin to come to fruition is an amazing thing. And a dream can often inspire dreams in others. This is true of most of us, isn't it? Think back to the book, the game, the movie that inspired you. That still dictates much of what you do today. Star Wars was a huge inspiration for so many people for so long. It was this kind of random thing that came out of nowhere. If you look at the science fiction movies that preceded it, there was a plastic quality to them. They felt unreal, and though some of them were amazing movies, they were not on the same level. When Star Wars came out and this story started taking place that really is a fantasy set in a science fiction universe. One of the biggest things that struck me when I look back at all these movies now is the fact that everything in Star Wars feels old. They tell us this right at the beginning, right? A long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. 
but we feel it. Even if that wasn't there, we feel it. When you see the X-Wings, when you see the Millennium Falcon, they are scarred. They have scuffs on them. And most of the things that occurred in science fiction prior looked brand new. And I think subtly our brains knew that this wasn't accurate. So when you start to see Star Wars for the first time and it feels like this world is lived in, it wasn't built specifically for this film, it felt real and it was inspiring. Now, how many things have cascaded and avalanched from Star Wars? Think of all the Star Wars series, all the novels, all the toys, all the video games, the continuation with the prequels and then the sequels. Whatever you might think about them, I have many opinions. But Star Wars itself in its own franchise has expanded and inspired tremendous amounts of dreams. And then think for just a moment about all the writers, the artists, and storytellers who were inspired to make their own things. A community exists now because of Star Wars. A community exists because of the Lord of the Rings and Tolkien's work. And these communities are different than what I was implying earlier, right? That was a community where people come together and they work on the same thing. But there is now a community of people that exists because of that dream. So yes, your dream can cause a community of people who are then inspired to make their own things. They could work at your company, they could work at your side, it could simply be your friends coming up with these ideas. Or it could be what we see with Star Wars and with Tolkien, where we see these massive communities online that still persist. On this platform right now, on YouTube, if you finish this video and you look up anything on Lord of the Rings, Tolkien, Star Wars, you will find entire channels, people that have dedicated their entire lives and livelihoods just to talking about the lore of those series. Not even talking about how the films were made, the storytelling and all the mechanisms for those things, simply talking about the lore. That is a community. It brings tremendous amounts of joy to people. It gives some people meaning in their life and it literally pays some people's paychecks. It's crazy, but community naturally comes out of good dreams. And so your dreams can be important for that exact same reason, that they can breed and help maintain community. And we as humans need community. Even when you're as introverted as I am, introverted as as many of us are as artists, you still need some community. It's just necessary. Dreams are by their nature future focused. Maybe one of the most important components of your dreams is that they force you to look forward. A dream, perhaps by its existence or definition, must be in the future. You don't dream about things that you already have, at least not in the sense that we're meaning here, where you look forward with hope towards a thing that might be. If the thing already is, then you don't dream for it, now do you? Dwelling on the past, thinking about past failures, is like tying a weight to your ankle and then trying to swim when it comes to artistic progress. You have to keep moving forward, and dreams can be the carrot at the end of the stick that keeps pulling you towards something new, something that requires your time and attention, something beautiful. And it's important for us because we have a tendency to fall into a couple different traps, one of which might be to just look at all the work that other people do, and we don't think about the fact that this is not what they could always do, this is just what they can do now because they followed their dreams. Sometimes we can look back at what we used to be able to do and we self-pity and we harp on ourselves and we go, my goodness, I should have stuck with this. I should have done this better. Sometimes we focus on the future in the wrong ways, but dreams necessarily force us to look at the future. And there's something beautiful about this because the future is the only thing that we're still moving into. The past already happened, the present we exist in, and it's bleeding into the future moment by moment by moment, isn't it? The future is where all of the beautiful things that can be lie. All of what is good in your life can continue to move into the future, but all that is bad could hopefully bleed away into nothingness as the future comes to be. So having a dream and holding on to it and working toward it necessarily points you in the future. And the wonderful thing is if you start laying the groundwork today to achieve whatever dream it is that you have artistically or creatively, you will inevitably take steps toward that future. And a lot of these steps are so small, so incremental, that just taking a couple here and there and knowing where you want to go can be all that's necessary to get you closer to achieving that dream. 
And I think maybe, uh, maybe this is just me, but in a lot of ways, I feel like just being able to see my progress toward a goal is often all the motivation I need to be able to stick to it. I don't need to see that I've achieved it. It's just if I, let's say I rated myself at like a 50 out of 100 on the drawing scale. I have no idea what this scale means, but let's just go with me for a second. And I can look back at my sketchbooks and go, yes, this was a 50 three years ago. And then I can look at a drawing I did two months ago and go, well, that was a 71. Like I'm at least getting a C now. If I can see progress, then I can assume progress will also happen in the future. And then my brain can just go wild thinking about how far things could potentially go. One of the beautiful things about dreams is that they force us to look forward. And this is really good for us because we can sometimes get hung up on the negative of the future or we can find ourselves bogged down by the past. Well, what do we do with this information? Some of you are likely feeling vindicated. I've just told you that dreams are good, you should have them more dreams equal more good. The dreams you hold close to your heart now feel like perhaps they are more valid. They are important and you can thumb your nose at anyone who thinks otherwise. But not all of us have dreams that course through our minds constantly. Generally, as I move through these podcasts, now would be the time to talk about how to do the thing, but I have to be honest, I'm not sure how to teach someone to have a dream. I'm honestly not even sure that would be right to do if you could. Dreams are complicated and they're often bound to our emotions and we tend to leave them behind in the attics of our minds as we age. But that actually brings me to where I think we should start, digging up old dreams. I think we start there, talking about the dreams of youth and then we will move into what to do with them, both for those who have to rekindle theirs or those who hoard dreams like Thanksgiving leftovers. And if you weren't already quite aware, I belong to that second group. All right, so digging up old dreams. Try to go back in your mind. Try to go back and find what got you into art in the first place. If you are like many of us who started work in your youth, you may have ample things to find. In our childhoods, when we draw or create, we often don't think about it. We simply do it. There's a beauty in this, but it seldom remains this way for long. Not that the beauty leaves, but that it grows and becomes something bigger, something greater. I guess all of this essentially leads to look backward. Try to find the old inspirations and then follow them to the dreams. Follow them to the things that pulled you in initially. If I go back to myself in high school, I can find the video games, the movies, the books that really inspired me initially. If I didn't hold on to the dreams that I hold on to now, which, frankly, a couple years ago I could have told you what they were, but I was doing nothing to go after them. But I could go back to high school, I could go back to middle school, when I really started engaging with art seriously. And even if I hadn't established dreams, I could go back to the things that got me excited, the things that inspired me in the first place. Some of it was friends. I had a couple of friends who were big storytellers, some who were phenomenal artists, and some who were just really good at telling stories. I had one friend, his name was John, and he seemed to know everything there was to know about Tolkien. I would ask him questions as I drove out to his house in the boonies and drove him to school in the mornings, just random questions about Lord of the Rings, about the Silmarillion, and he would spiral. He could tell me about all the Valar, he could tell me where the Maiar came from as he began to just tell stories about Tolkien's world. At a couple different points, he and I actually started to sit down and write, write our own stories. But he was inspirational because of the lore that he knew, all of these things that he had gained just from reading over and over and over again. I had another friend, his name was Dan, and he was an exceptional artist and a great storyteller. The motivations that I got from him was he was the first person I ran into who was a true world builder. He had stories, races, planets, and ideas when I met him for the first time in late middle school. And I was captured by this. I had of course read The Hobbit by then, and I had begun to read some other fantasy things. I hadn't yet read The Lord of the Rings by that point in time. and. I was captivated, captivated by these stories, captivated by all of the lore and the things that could be contained within them. And I really do think that is the spur, that is the thing that pushed me forward to start building my own worlds, to start creating my own stories, was that relationship, the time with him and the idea that this could be done. 
But there are movies, there are video games, there are films, there are TV series, and there are other friends that I can go back to and I can find. And they spurred me on, they pushed me forward towards new things. All of this comes down to if I go back in my head to all of my friends, just mostly to prove that I'm not unique here, that I'm not just the weirdo who held on to his dreams and who had dreams. All of my artistic friends, all of my creative friends had some dream to do something in the industry in some capacity, even if it was just to make art for the rest of their lives. Some have and some have not. But I really think that if any of those people were to go back in their hearts, go back in their minds, they would be able to find what those dreams were. And so I think there's a very good chance for you too, listener, artist, friend, that you probably have dreams. They probably just lay covered in the back recesses of your mind. And if you go back to the things that inspired you, if you go back to what really pushed you when you were younger, you may just find them. We all had dreams. As many of us got older, they died, or more likely, they were just buried under safer things, like having a job, pursuing a career, and whatever it might be. These are not bad things, of course. We need to eat, we need to have shelter, and if you have a family, you have an obligation to take care of them. I think, however, that those dreams of our youth persist, and they exist beneath the surface, crying out to be let free from their murky prison. We can do much for ourselves, and I think much for our own humanity, by reclaiming them, by finding them, giving them some attention, maybe apologizing to them for disregarding them for so long. And also, from my own personal experience, we can give ourselves some grace in realizing that life keeps moving on, and that these dreams, though long forgotten, we, we can still move with them, we can still move forward. I have a tendency to beat myself up sometimes because I took about 10 years off of working on any of my dreams, any of my stories, any of my art, and it hurts because I'm 36 now. I'll be 37 next month, and I don't like thinking about the fact that if I had taken those 10 years, the, the places I could be artistically, the, the stories that I could have written by now, I, I, I can't fathom what that is. The problem with that whole train of thought is that it's terribly unproductive, and it just reeks of doom and despair. Like, even if I'm right, even if I'm right that I could have done all these things and I didn't do them, so what? What benefit do I have in going back and acknowledging that? The only thing that can be done now is to do the things moving forward, is to give in to my dreams and pursue them now. Because the reality is, 20 years from now, a couple more than 20 years from now, 23 years from now, when I hit 60 years old, if I haven't pursued these things, if I didn't try to tell my stories, if I didn't try to become a better artist, I know definitively I would look at myself and I would go, you never tried, punk, and you'll never know if you could have done it. Well, now I'm trying. And if it doesn't succeed, I know I tried. I will still have the novels written, and if they never get published, there's something that can go to my daughter. There's something that my friends and my wife can read, and I got them off my chest. If I never become a great artist, but I continue to dedicate all this time to it, I still can take solace in the fact that I tried. And if I hit old age and didn't know, there is no way I would let myself off the hook. I would regret it forever. Now, I don't know if you're built exactly like me, where you're that hard on yourself, but if you are any piece of that, then I urge you to find your dreams, to give them whatever time and energy you can. You might be very busy. You might be a mother of three. You might be a stay-at-home dad. You might have only an hour a week that you can put into a thing. You might even not have an hour a week guaranteed, but... If you give your dreams the time and energy that you have to give to them, not sacrificing other things, I truly think and believe that you will not regret it. It will be to your benefit, and I think it will be to the benefit of everyone else around you. I think that me getting back into writing, I've been putting in almost an hour of writing every day for the last um, 180, 190 days now, and I'm happier, I'm more fulfilled. And I've heard this from my wife too, and she's excited that I'm actually finally starting to work on these things. But I see the results. I see the results in my life. Not only am I getting things done, but I feel better. And I'm excited and I'm happy. And I do know now that even if it goes nowhere, I will be happy that I did it. So I, I just urge you to 
give in to your dreams just a little bit, to go back and find them if you have lost them, to unearth them and bring them back to the light of day. Reclaim them, search and find them. Don't give up on them, they are a part of you. And even if you have to slowly re-engage with that relationship, it will almost certainly be to your benefit. What about choosing a dream? So if you belong to the second group, the ones like myself who hold dreams, remember them, or perhaps even have too many of them, let's think about this for a few minutes. First of all, try to be thankful that you have them, that your optimism or spirit has remained in a place where you can still hold on to your dreams and acknowledge them. This is a more beneficial thing than you might think. In fact, coming after the section we just talked about, there are many people who have let go of their dreams, who maybe had to let go of their dreams just to pay the bills, just to be okay with themselves and to go to sleep at night. So if you happen to be in a position where you have held on to your dreams, be thankful for them. They are a wonderful thing and they are a part of you. So thinking about what to do with them, how to choose the, the particular one that you're going to invest time into, I, I would think the, the best place to start is to think about joy. Try to figure out which of your dreams brings the most joy into your life. Joy is an ethereal thing and it's very much different than happiness, right? Happiness is kind of this fleeting thing and joy is this enduring thing. So think about the dreams that you have, the ones that will bring you more joy. For me, this is storytelling in whatever capacity it is. Right now, the piece that's unfolding as you, as you listen to this is storytelling. It's Andorra, she's been warped underground and she's discovering the, the original version of her planet that was covered when the gods had to quell a rebellion tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years ago. And yet life has persisted, things that are very different than the surface world. She's going to run into some eldritch things down here, some really terrifying, grotesque things, but also beautiful things. And she made her friend with the, uh, the little kraken that's floating around, whose name eludes me at the moment, or I changed and so I can't remember what the name is. But this is storytelling, and for me, that brings me the most joy, is being able to tell stories. Uh, visual stories, written stories, I don't really care. It brings me joy. So find the one that brings you the most joy. Next, perhaps think about practicality, which is the easiest to obtain, or perhaps the most likely to lead to what you desire in life. So this might counteract the first one, and that's why I started with joy. I feel like if joy really eliminates the others and leads you to a single conclusion, then just stick with that. You don't really need to do anything else. But if you've got several that are in the same capacity as I do, then maybe thinking about practicality. So again, looking at the piece that's unfolding here, putting together a children's book is a lot more achievable than me putting together a graphic novel right now. My artistic skills are just not in the place where I could do that. But doing about 30 to 40 illustrations that are almost all of them lower scale than this, and then the 30 to 50 lines of text necessary for a children's book is a lot more attainable. I don't know how to go about any of this stuff with publishing, but I do know that I could actually finish the product. I have the skills and the ability to do that right now. Putting together the novel that I'm working on is maybe a little unattainable, but it's also just... I understand that I could write the whole thing and then chew on it and work on second and tertiary drafts for years. And so I'm okay with that. But practically speaking, I'm trying to hone in on the things that make the most sense in an achievable fashion. Think about collaboration, which is the most likely to garner other people's attention and therefore perhaps provide you with accountability and friendship. There are certain artistic things that I work on because other people in my life work on them, because I am more prone to have friends to do these things with. It's important. It's really important for us to have people to work alongside. Now, a lot of this can happen online on Discord communities and things like that nowadays, but I also have a really good friend now who's uh, coming down once a week and we're spending time painting and drawing together. It's a really good thing for my soul. It's a good thing for my art, but it's just a good thing for me as a human being. So think about the dreams that are going to allow you to collaborate with friends, to make new friends that are going to have people that are going to bind to them. You could also think about this in the sense of like, what are the, what are the dreams that are going to get people excited, that they might be willing to get behind you for a Kickstarter or something like that, but that's really starting to get into a whole other thing. And maybe at some point I will, as I get further down the path, maybe I'll do some videos on like how to actually bring your artistic ideas to fruition in that sense. I'm not there yet, so I would be kind of talking out my backside if I tried to do that. 
Well, I think the next area that we have to go is what to do with dreams. This is strange, I must admit. What do we do with a dream? I think you hold on to them. I, I, I think if you are lucky enough that you've held them this entire time, you hold on to them and you're thankful for them. If you've just reclaimed yours or you need to go dig in the attic to find yours, you hold on to it and you're thankful for it. And I think then you let it guide you. You see, that's the weird thing with dreams in general is they don't really have a secret answer to them, do they? You have to follow them. You have to engage with them and they will lead you. Each of our dreams are so different, but they kind of, by their very nature, lead us in a direction. If your dream is to tell a story, then you've got to figure out how to tell stories. If your dream is to make a comic book, then you have to figure out how comic books are made and you have to start working on those skills. If your dream is to live in a little cabin and write books on, you know, way up in the mountains, then you've got to figure out how to write and then you've got to figure out, can you afford a cabin? Each of the dreams specifically leads you toward whatever it is that needs to happen for it to be fulfilled. So there's not really a secret answer here, I don't think. It's just a matter of each of our own unique dreams will lead us to what needs to be done to achieve them. And I guess there probably needs to be a note in here about like making sure your dream is good and making sure your dream is worth following. But I think in general, we tend to be much harder on our dreams. And I think the issue that we have is likely that we don't believe in them more than we're going to have a dream that is terrible and we shouldn't follow through it. Like if your dream is to take over the world and enslave all of humanity, like please don't. But that's probably not the issue most of us are gonna have artistically. So I don't know that I really have any sound advice about what to do with your dreams other than once you have them and you're acknowledging them and you're putting time and energy into them, I think they will probably naturally tell you what you need to do. They will naturally pull you in a direction and they will naturally lead you in a certain way. And maybe this is optimistic. I don't tend to be very optimistic, but in this capacity, sometimes I am filled with hope. I do think that most of us have the ability, should we truly choose to do something with it, to bring our ideas to life. I don't think every single one of us are going to be professional artists, but I do think that every single one of us could be artists in a capacity that we are achieving our goals to a greater or lesser extent. I, I think that's a possibility. I think most of us just frankly give up on it, like I did for most of my life. And so now the re-engaging is its own interesting thing. But I'm not particularly an optimistic person. I just, what I have watched happen in my own life, in the life of other artists, and in the life of other people, hundreds if not thousands of people over the years of teaching, it does seem that if you're willing to put in the time, you can get some form of whatever that dream is achieved. And you just have to be cautious about what that form looks like. Maybe you're not gonna be a best-selling author, but you can probably publish a book. In fact, you can publish a book for sure because self-publishing exists. You might not be able to make, you know, $100,000 a year as a painter, but you can be a painter who sells paintings. And if you're willing to be really frugal, you might even be able to do that as your full-time career. It's just, there's adjustments there. And I'm old enough now that I'm more flexible. I'm more okay with making adjustments. Well, what are my dreams? This is a little awkward, um, but I think it's fair. We just spent 30 some odd minutes talking about dreams and their necessity. And it seems, although perhaps a little bit awkward for me to talk about my dreams, it seems fair. And I hope that in doing so, it might make some of you who have audacious dreams capable of realizing that you're not the only one who holds audacious dreams and sometimes you have to hold them anyway. But this is a little awkward, not because I feel awkward talking about them, but because it always feels weird to put yourself out there. In addition, I want to dismantle any pride associated with these dreams. I am not asserting that I think I can achieve them, at least not in the truest sense, but like I just mentioned, I think that most of our dreams are achievable if we are willing to be flexible on what we mean by achieving them. And I certainly don't think I'm more likely to achieve mine than anyone else. I don't think I'm better than anyone else. I am fully aware of the ridiculous nature of the dreams and how unattainable they may be in the truest sense. Yet, I hold them all the same and will continue to work on them until I can no longer do so. The first, I think, is something that many of us hold, and it's just an artistic life. I would love to be able to get up every morning and work as an artist. 
where I start drawing with my first cup of coffee and I bring beautiful things to life. I'm able to share those things with others and bring joy to them through my own artistic adventures. I want to be able to sit around and draw and paint and write stories. And who doesn't? If you're listening to this podcast, if you are still here right now, can you seriously tell me that you don't also want that? You don't also want that form of life? And again, that's maybe the most achievable out of all these because that's not defining what kind of art I'm doing. But there is something to be said for yearning for that life. For a, I would just like the majority of my paycheck to come from making art, even if it's only for a couple years of my life. And it's an exciting prospect that might be something I can get to in the next couple years. My career, I was paid to teach other people how to make art. That's a little bit different. The next is the fantasy series I've been working on, the novel I'm actually working on right now, which is called The Nether Void Chronicles. And it's a big undertaking. The book I'm working on right now is supposed to be the first of a trilogy. It was going to be about 150,000 words. And just for comparison, The Fellowship of the Ring, Tolkien's first book, was about 154,000 words, if I'm not mistaken. If I am, I'll flash it on the screen now. Um, That book has climbed now to approximately 240,000 words by the time it's done. So an extra 90,000 on top of The Fellowship of the Ring. And it is the first of three. So it is expanding. The dream there is, of course, at a base level to be able to write all these stories, to tell the stories, and then to get them out there. Obviously, it would be lovely to be published, to be an author, to have my books in bookstores. At this point, I'm mostly just content to figure out how to write, to get the stories down, to make sure they function, and to continue world building and telling the stories. At a certain point, once all three are written, I probably will fairly seriously pursue editing and trying to see if I can get the things published. But in the meantime, that's kind of the idea there. The next would be the Catalyst Saga, which is a science fiction storyline that I worked on with a very good friend of mine. This is significantly less developed than the Nether Void Chronicles, but it's the same kind of thing. It's a trilogy of some sort. I always envisioned it when I was young as a set of movies, and I think that that's probably the medium that it would work best in. I don't know if I will write these as books, but... Given where my skills are going and the resources that I have uh, in my friends and my community, this might end up being a series of graphic novels or comic books at some point. It is not on my horizon to work on them. Um, Right now, I've got a lot of other things on my plate, but at some point, I will go and actually work through those stories as well. They're really fun. It takes it's a it's a crew kind of like you would see in Serenity or Firefly, which are awesome sci fi series. Um, And they are on a ship called the Icarus which if you are familiar with mythology, tells you a little bit about uh, that crew in and of itself. I looked at having the ship be called the Daedalus, but that's been used in sci-fi before. And then when I looked at the story of Icarus, I went, nah, that makes more sense. And uh, the ship is built around a a rail gun. Um, It's actually probably not a rail gun. It's probably more of a Goss cannon, but rail gun sounds cooler. And it is a magnetically powered rifle of some sorts. And the entire ship is built around this as the central component, literally in the core of the ship. Um, And so that that just plays into a lot of things. I'm not going to expand upon it much right now. I will maybe at a later date, but that's the science fiction story. The one after that is Amongst the Broken, which is the series that uh, all my robot creatures belong to. And it is a really weird, like post-apocalyptic um dolls like the movie nine but they exist underneath siberia and for some reason the refuse of humanity is all there the long story short is basically the cold war happened all of humanity died and this one genius girl in siberia managed to conjure a device that could trap human souls in inanimate objects that is then where all these dolls and robots have their life. They have the, the souls that have been harnessed from humanity, not allowed to move on to the afterlife or to go into non-existence. And so this world exists beneath the ice. And at the end of the day, they're trying to work on how do we get humanity restored? And that's what's going to take part or take place over the series of probably graphic novels. That one was kind of always intended to be graphic novels, but That one is also a series of songs. One of my favorite bands, if not my favorite band, is Coheed and Cambria, and all of their albums are science fiction stories. I was inspired to do this, and I started writing songs for the Catalyst saga. Those got pretty dark. 
and eventually I started writing songs for Amongst the Broken. These are whimsical in a lot of ways, very funny songs, and I've got maybe 20 or 30 of them written. My daughter has been so sweet lately, but she keeps asking to listen to them in the car, which is hard not to tear up when your kid's like, I want to listen to your songs, Dad. Um, but that was kind of conceived as music first and foremost, and that's something that's on my plate for this year too. I would like to actually finish off that first album and then be able to release it here or wherever I can. All of the songs are pretty much written. I just have to go through and remaster them because I have better technology and better microphones and those things. And then I think accompanying that will be a graphic novel at some point. That one's probably going to be what I dedicate my time to next year, um, especially as things keep moving forward artistically. Um, Beyond that, I would like to be in a gallery and I would like to sell my paintings. And I am really happy to say that I just got into a gallery um, a month ago, which has been really exciting. So that's almost like a piece of dream achieved. And it's, it's really exciting. And I'm going to see where that goes as well. And then the last one here is kind of, I, I would like to, if I am able to achieve some measure of success as an artist, as a writer, I would like to immediately start pumping that money back into the artistic community. Because if I had had people who believed in me when I was younger, who put time and energy into my pursuits, I think I could have hit them a lot earlier. I'm really stubborn and I tend to be very judgmental and very strong-willed. And so I'm working on these things now, but I know that most people by my age have kind of given up on them. So if I ended up with a glut of money, with the ability to actually disperse money to hire people for things, I would like to kick that back in and, and develop some manner of mentorship program or even a company that literally finds young artists with good ideas and then helps them get to the point where they can achieve those. Nowadays, we are so fortunate to have things like Kickstarter and YouTube where if I was in that position, I literally could just be like, yeah, we will help fund this Kickstarter. Like we will finish it out for you. Um, we would like to go in and partner with you on this. And you know, we'll pay for X amount, you'll pay us back. I don't know all the financials, I haven't really thought about it, but it's one of those kind of long-term inspirational things for me. If I had the ability where I was making money from the things that I was doing, I would like to, once, I, once I'm able to take care of myself and my family, I would like to push it back and be like, no, I wanna go find young people and bring their ideas to life now. Because that's what I wanted. That's what I really would have benefited from. And I just, most of my students who've gone on to make art, most of my friends who had their dreams in high school, like they were cool things. And so many of those will never see the light of day because it's so financially risky to engage in those things. So that's another one that's just, again, these are, these are my dreams. These are big things. Um, it's awkward for me to talk about them because it's a little bit vulnerable, but I'm hoping that, you know, we're now getting close to 50 minutes into this podcast. If you're still here, then, um, I mean, you, you're probably bought in or you're on the same wavelength and same page. So thank you for listening to all of these rambles. I, I hope that there's been some benefit to you through all of this. If you have dreams that you hold on to, I would love for you to share them in the comments below. But again, like it's kind of awkward and it kind of forces you to be a little vulnerable. So maybe if you do that, don't feel like any pressure to do it um, at the level that I did. Maybe just be really, really close-lipped about it and just like, I would like to work on a book of the, in, this, in this genre. That's fine. If you want to expand more, you feel comfortable doing so, that would be lovely. I would love to hear it. I still have the capacity to respond to pretty much every comment I get, and I would love to do that. Well, as always, I appreciate you all so much for your time. This one was supposed to be a 30-minute podcast, and as I'm recording right now, though I know I'm going to trim it down a little bit, I'm at 52 minutes. I think it will probably end at about 47 or 48, because I had some re-recording and some cuts in the middle. But thank you so much. Have a good one, y'all. See you soon.